yeah. Yeah. Super. So, um, so yes, as Jen's already said, I'm Claire Davidson, one of the um, paediatricians with expertise working at Pinderfields. And Emma, who's one of our F1s, um, has very kindly helped with some of the data analysis and is going to talk about the results. Uh, so we're kind of doing a bit of a, a, a joint presentation today. Um, so my, my kind of interest in this project started a couple of years ago, actually, because um, and I'll, I'll talk more about, there was a patient that Elsbeth actually sent an Alive Core device out to, um, one of mine, and it was really helpful in the diagnosis. And subsequent to that, we've, we've managed to get some, we've given them out of Pinderfields. And I've had quite a positive experience with them, but obviously the sample size is quite small in terms of how many I've been given out over the last couple of years. Um, so this kind of came about for, from a discussion with Joe because I was just interested to know what, as a network, and as a region, our experience of the use of a live course have been, and specifically, were they useful when we were trying to diagnose palpitations in children? Right. Has my, have my slides moved on OK? Yeah. So most of the people on the talk today might be aware of what a live core is, but I was just conscious if there were nurses or cardiology, um, cardiophysiologists and things that hadn't seen them. Uh, this is this is what a live core is. So basically, it is a smartphone device that looks exactly like that. There, it's got two little pads on it. So basically, you give the patient that device, and they then load a cardia app onto their mobile phone. And then, when the child is having symptoms, they they get the child to put their fingers on those pads, as you can see there, and that generates a single trace ECG. It's a thirty sec second recording that can then be. Well, actually, the app does it itself. It puts it into a PDF document that can then be emailed across. So that's the system we use at Pinderfields when we give them out. It's only Matt Pye, who's the other pecker in Mid York, and myself uh, that give them out. And patients email those PDF documents back to our secretaries. That's the system we've set up. So just for anybody that hasn't seen it before. So the case study I was just talking about, and I know that Mike Blackburn's talking after this with a few others. So this was just very briefly, but this was a 14 year old boy who had palpitations on exertion, which were infrequent, but they were troublesome and they would last about 15 to 20 minutes, just not long enough for him to get to hospital um, to ever get a recording. But he was quite he felt quite unwell at the time. Um, they they had got morphine, but was still sort of only once a month or so. So he'd had a normal 12 EDCG. We'd been able to catch them on a tape. Um, he had an exercise test because they were primarily on exercise, which reassured me they were probably sinus tachycardia, but they were very sudden onset and offset. And he was able to give a very clear history, um, which just, I don't know, something just niggled. It probably it just didn't feel like total typical sinus tachy. Anyway, referring to the joint clinic for Elsbeth to see, actually, for possibly a reveal device, because that was the only other option at that stage. This was two or three years ago. Um, and interestingly, when I was on when I was on maternity leave at the time, he saw Elsbeth get, and she gave him a live call. And within three months, he, he'd obtained a recording and it showed he was going into SVT. So he ended up having an ablation. So I came back from maternity leave and was a bit like, oh, that's all very interesting because obviously he's you know I didn't really even know actually about these devices at that point and this had been so useful in this patient um who I'd spent about I don't know six or nine months trying to get you know get an answer for the family was it all sinus tacky was it not so really helpfully um we obtained some charitable funding from the children's heart surgery fund to get five devices which i received back in september 2019 and that allowed us to sort of start the ball rolling in terms of giving these out in mid yorkshire um so i started and as did matt giving them out to patients with infrequent symptoms of palpitations plus or minus chest pain um, so we know you know as you know some patients have got symptoms that are frequent enough we can catch them on a tape um, or, a, a, you know, seven day tape. Um, but for those that are having very frequent symptoms that do have a history suggestive of, of possible SVT, or even just to sometimes reassure the family, um, those are the patients we were sending them out to. So in total, we've sent 10 out and we've had five back. And those five, and well, certainly two or three of those five have been ones we've then managed to send out again. So we have been reusing them. But really helpfully, we've had a further five now from the Children's Heart Surgery Fund. So we've got 10 in Mid Yorks all together. And as I say, our experience has been positive, but because it was such a small sample size, we just wanted to look at more data from across the region and get bigger numbers. 
So essentially, so our aim of this piece of work was to establish whether an alive core device is useful in the diagnosis of palpitations in children. And this was a list of the objectives. So we just wanted an idea across the region of how many children were being given devices, what's the indication for the use of the device, how many children used the device to get a recording, and in how many cases was that then helpful? Ultimately, what diagnosis was made and what was the outcome for the child? So those were the kind of questions that we really wanted to focus on. So I sent, as people might remember, I sent an email out to all the PECs working, or Joe actually sent it out for me, I think, to all the PECs working within uh, the network to see if we'd get any data back. But I was conscious at that time that probably most of the other DGHs hadn't actually had them for very long, so wouldn't have been giving them out to then get them back to have data, because that's the problem, obviously, you give them out, but patients might have these for three, six, nine months before they capture a reading and then you, then you get them back. Um, or get the recording of them. Um, Joe really kindly provided details of patients in the notes. So kind of between us, we looked at the Leeds database. We had clinic letters and notes from Pinderfields that we went through. And there were 48 patients in total that we managed to, to well, we could see that had been sent out a live cause. Um, and that was between April 2019, which appeared to be the first patient use on the basis of the information we had through until the present. So Emma was just going to come in and talk a bit through the results now, and I'll come back in the end just to, to summarise and, and, and cover the points of discussion. Yeah, so nice to meet you all. My name's Emma. Um, I'm currently an F1 at Pinderfield, so I don't know many of you, but it's nice to meet you, even if it's just via Teams. <laughs> um, so as Dr Davidson was saying, we gave out 45 of the Alive Core devices. Um, and as you can see on the map, the majority of them are around Yorkshire. So that those four big pinpoints are just west, east, south and the other one, North Yorkshire. Um, a couple down in Nottinghamshire um, and Lincolnshire and then one down in Wiltshire. Um, so of our 45 patients, there were 29 um, male patients, 19 female patients with an age range of three to 17 years. So quite a broad age range to test whether the devices were useful um, in paediatric patients. Can I? press the slides or is it not? Yeah, there you go Emma. Thank you. Um, so as Dr Davidson was saying, the main reason we wanted to provide the Alive Core devices were for children with palpitations and chest pain. Um, and this diagram just shows of the 48 patients what, what the main indication for giving it out was. So as you can see, about 67% of patients did have palpitations, whether that was with or without chest pain. Um, and there were a few other indications in there. So just chest pain on its own, collapse, disease, shortness of breath and then a few others such as patients with known um, SVT who were on treatment to see whether it was helpful, the treatment was helping, um, some patients with some family history of cardiac arrhythmias um, and one patient had tachycardia and one patient we didn't have it recorded as to what the indication was. Sorry, thank you. So what we found was that in out of all of our 48 patients that the Alive Core was used to diagnose 23 of them, so 48%. So about one in two patients, it was really useful in providing that diagnosis. Um, in about 13 patients, so 27%, it wasn't used, um, and we'll come into why that is on the next slide. Um, and unfortunately, about 25% of our patients, we didn't have the data in the notes to determine whether they'd been used yet or whether they weren't useful. Um, so we continued to keep them in the analysis just because it might be that we don't have the result because it hasn't been useful, but we can't tell you that for sure because it's not recorded in the notes yet. Um, and of our patients with palpitations, with or without chest pain, so our main cohort of patients that we wanted to send the Alive Cause out for, it was again useful in over 50% of patients this time, 56%, um, and not of use in fewer patients. So only 19% of patients found that it wasn't useful to get them a diagnosis. Thank you. So as I mentioned, um, 13 of our 48 patients didn't find the Alive Core devices useful in the diagnosis of their um, symptoms. And about half of these, so as you can see, six out of 13 patients, this was because their symptoms improved in that time. So obviously, because we send the devices out into the community, they don't, well, it's not necessarily an immediate um, 
use of the device. So in that time, some patient symptoms improved, which is good and a good outcome for them anyway. Um, one patient just didn't, um, well, didn't have good patient compliance with the device. So I think they did not attend their follow up appointments. So we're not sure of the outcome for them. Um, and again, about six, so almost half of patients were unable to capture a trace with the Alive Core device. A few of these were because the symptoms were short lived. So by the time they realized they were having symptoms and had popped their fingers on the pads, the symptoms had stopped. Um, but that was only two of the six patients and four of the six patients just mentioned that they were unable to use it to capture a trace, but we don't have a detailed reason as to why that was. Thank you. Um, so with the Alive Core device, the majority of patients, um, when they were having their symptoms, it recorded a trace of normal sinus rhythm. Um, and we'll come on to how that's, oh, sorry, bear with me. <laughs> oh dear. Sorry, I'm in a room with automatic lights. <laughs> um, so no, nine, about 50% of patients, um, recorded normal sinus rhythm. So we'll come on to how that affects their kind of management after. About 22% of patients recorded sinus tachycardia. And quite interestingly, um, again, 22% of patients, so four of those 18 patients actually recorded supraventricular tachycardia, which we thought was quite a high proportion of patients for children presenting with palpitations or chest pain. Um, and as you can see at the bottom, I just didn't have room for the ECG um, recording. One patient had um, ectopic beats found on their Alive Core device. So of our main cohort of patients, so those with palpitations and chest or chest pain, 72%, um, so this was the main point we wanted to make, 72% of them were then able to be reassured and discharged. So this was a big relief for families, for children, and it means that they're not continuing to have ongoing investigations um, and outpatient appointments within the hospital. Um, two of the patients, so 11%, have continued a live core use, and I think that was because they still wanted a bit more reassurance when their symptoms came on. So even though they'd had a recording of normal sinus rhythm, they wanted to just double check that and keep, keep trying it, basically. Um, Again, two of the 18 patients then went on to have further investigations um, and one of them um, who recorded SVT and then went on to have medical management um, of the SVT. So in summary, um, as I think I've reiterated, the main indication that we gave out the Alive Core devices um, was palpitations um, with or without chest pain. And of those patients who presented with palpitations, it helped to make a diagnosis in 56% of them, so over one in two patients. Um, and the main rhythms we detected were sinus rhythm or supraventricular tachycardia. Um, of our patients with palpitations, 72% of them were able to be reassured and discharged. Um, as I say, reassuring with patients, the families, and meaning they don't have to have further unnecessary investigations and appointments. Thank you, Emma. That was <clears throat> that's great. So that was a kind of summary of our results. Um, my kind of points for discussion and thoughts from that was around indications for use, because certainly kind of chest pain and palpitations are the, are the prime group, if you like, that we would give these out for palpitations primarily. They had been given out in a couple of episodes of collapse, um, which I think I would consider the live call to be a lot less helpful in that situation. And I don't think that's an indication for use because obviously you'd be looking more to reveal in that case um, simply because the children aren't going to be able to put their fingers on if, if they've then if they've had an episode of loss of consciousness. Um, so I think it's about being clear for, for why we're giving them out and who which children we give them to. Um, I had I just wonder what other people's thoughts were on this really about should all children have a tape in addition to the alive core um, because obviously if you've got symptoms say once every I don't know six to eight weeks so you're never really going to catch them on a tape you're going to give them a live core but actually is it is it helpful to have done a 24-hour tape just to have 24 hours of recording and a bit more information before you then give them the alive core or actually we better just give them the alive core and I wondered what other people and kind of the cardiologist and Fiona really if, if you've got any thoughts about that um, we could always come back to that at the end when we finish presenting. Um, I think the really key thing from this was that we've got to be really clear that families know how to use these devices 
because actually the where they haven't been helpful in diagnosis uh, the main reason for that yes you've got the fact that their symptoms have resolved which as emma said then is great because actually their symptoms are resolved and they don't need any more investigations um but actually if they're struggling to use the device then that's something that hopefully we, we could potentially overcome. I mean, certainly the kids that I've given them out to have been primarily, I would say, over the age of 10, who've often got their own phones and the teenagers are a whiz at this. So I think this is sometimes a problem in younger children with older parents. Not that I want to speculate about older parents being possibly one myself now, but, you know, I think it's just, it's making sure that people can use them and are able to manage the technology and can download the app. The way we try and get around that Pinderfields is when we send out the device, we send out the information sheet um, and then we get parents to send back a test strip. So we know they've got the device. We know that they've managed to download the app. They've managed to work it and they've managed to email us a strip so that it, and it's that sometimes is where. So I've had one family, certainly, that were like, we just, I just can't do it. The mum just couldn't manage it um and we just in the end ended up giving up she tried about four or five times with different things and i said look we'll talk about it bring it back to clinic with you when i next see you and we'll we'll look at it together um so i think some people will struggle with it but actually certainly in older children they can often use it themselves and then it was just you know 56 percent. so one in two children who were given a live call basically it was it aided diagnosis and was a direct patient benefit which i think is really important now the actual figure might be higher as emma said there was a difficulty with lack of documentation so sometimes patients were being given a live call come back to clinic and then there just wasn't anything documented about the alive core or readings or anything like that so it's hard to know. We didn't we didn't want to exclude them from the analysis because it may be those patients struggle to use it and therefore it didn't help with diagnosis. Um, but obviously we just we just don't know. Those patients obviously didn't send a recording back. So whether they had a, an issue trying to use it or not, um, we'll never know. But I think we do know that one in two found it helpful and it gave us it aided diagnosis. And then you've also got a cost implication because interestingly it is cheaper. So these devices, even if they were single use, which you can reuse them, are cheaper than a tape. So I was just, I was having a look um, yesterday. And if you look at Leeds, on the Leeds, it's the National Institute for Health Research. 24 and 40 hour tapes cost 162 pounds. Um, by the time you've taken into the cost of the tape, the um, analysis, the fitting of it, you know, everything, Whereas this, these were, well, these are currently eight to nine pounds actually. So there's, they're definitely cheaper than using a tape. Another thing I just wanted to mention, which I don't think people have become aware of this, is this is literally in the last few weeks. So NICE are now recommending them in adults as an option for detecting AF in patients uh, with symptoms such as people presenting with symptoms such as palpitations. Um, and actually, if you look at the NICE document, like significantly more people had AF detected using an alive core than a halter. And the cost modeling, I mean, it's a negligible saving of £13, but actually what it does suggest is that it's no more expensive to be using a live cause than halters in adults with palpitations and you are getting better results and better pickup rates. Um, so I think that's fairly compelling in adults um, and, you know, again, kind of supports their use really, I think, in, in palpitations in children. Obviously, limitations was a sample size. Um, so we had 48 patients, but there was some lack of information documentation meant we couldn't evaluate the use in 25%. Um, and I just wanted to finish by saying thank you to the Children's Heart Surgery Fund, because without them, I would have never had, I don't think, any um, devices or certainly would have taken me a lot longer to have got any devices. Um, the plan has always been if we could get some with with charitable funding, which we have and I know other DGHs have as well. The long term plan is obviously if we can get some data, we can prove they're useful, we can prove they're cheaper than doing tapes in these children. Um, that then that gives us kind of some impetus to get business cases through so we can get funding for them within our individual trusts. But thank you for the Children's Heart Surgery Fund, who've really allowed us as a region to start the ball rolling with this. Um, and that's it. Any questions? Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Claire and Emma. That was really